Okay, so uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to this workshop. Um, uh, first, I must admit that I'm not an expert on homological mirror symmetry, so um, uh, especially my uh, my knowledge about uh, syntactic topology is very limited and outdated. Uh, but I think I know a few things about curve counting and uh, derived categories, and that's what I'm going to talk about uh, uh, in this hour uh, related to mirror symmetry. Um, so the, the main theme of my talk is critical locus. So often in mathematics, uh, critical points uh, uh, retain vital information about the model or space, like in Morse theory or stationary space stationary phase approximation. Of course, there are many, many more examples of this phenomenon. And everybody has their own um, examples or theory. Um, <clears throat> in, and in this hour, I'm going to talk about some of these localization phenomena to critical loci or a curve counting theory and uh, their categories. So, um, speaking of critical lo loci, uh, let me talk about uh, let me mention a recent uh, development in algebraic geometry related to critical loci. Um, if f is a homomorphic function on a complex manifold M, uh, the, the critical locus is defined as the zero locus of the differential of f, the section of the bundle, and, and it comes automatically with the perverse sheaf, uh, perverse sheaf of vanishing cycles, and that basically gives us the homology of the Miller fiber function f. And uh, suppose we have an energy space, suppose your moduli space. However singular it may be, it may come with some nice atlas which consists of charts. And each of these charts is the critical locus of a holomorphic function defined on a manifold, a smooth complex manifold. And then suppose these charts are compatible in a suitable fashion and, uh, and, uh, and, and they are also orientable then we can glue these locally defined purple sheaves into a globally defined purple sheaf. You can think about the hypercomality. That turns out to be quite, in, quite useful. For instance, you can define homological Donald Thomas invariant or category 5 Donald Thomas invariant. Or you can uh, give a mathematical theory of Kopakumbavafa invariant by using this kind of uh, purple sheaf arguments. Okay, so that's, that's just a passing remark. Um, so, um, in, I think in homological mirror symmetry of lambda Ginsburg models, uh, the derived, derived mirror periodicity is an example of the localizing phenomena to critical loci. Um, so, in this talk, I will consider only one LG model, uh, this one, the simplest one possible, perhaps. The uh, X is the C star quotient of D plus one dimensional complex vector space. And, uh, there are x coordinates and p coordinates. And this is the x on the x coordinates with weight 1 and the p coordinate with weight minus d. And f is the x coordinates. And w is the product of p and f. So that means w of c star invariant function. So uh, x as it stands is just an artist stack. And then uh, w is a function defined on this artist stack. Okay, so, um, right, there are two, um, there are two open substacks which are doing Mumford in this case, uh, uh, or you can say there are two GID quotients of the d plus one dimensional space by the system action. So, as you see, there this this d plus one dimensional vector space has positive weight part and negative weight part. X variables are positive part and p variables are negative weight part. So GIT quotient says uh, you have to delete the origin of the one of the positive part or negative parts. So you can delete the origin of the x coordinates or you can delete the origin of the p coordinates. That's what, what GIT tells us. So if you choose positive, if you choose to delete the origin of the positive weight part, uh, the, the x-coordinates gives you the projective space of dimension d minus 1, and the p-coordinate gives you uh, the line bundle of degree minus d, that's the canonical line bundle on projective space. And uh, 
and the W nowadays now now this guy is O minus D and is homomorphism from O minus D to O is given by a section of uh, OD which is a degree D homogeneous polynomial and this map is given by a given by multiplication by the homogeneous polynomial F we have chosen and X minus on the other hand you can delete the origin of the P coordinates and because if you delete uh, the origin of C and quotient by C star, then you get just a point, but there is a stabilizer, ZD. And, uh, uh, these roots of unity. And then, uh, so the GIT quotient is the quotient of D dimensional vector space by the action of ZD. And uh, the map W also descends to this uh, quotient, and the map is just the evaluation by the polynomial F. And uh, uh, Witten uh, in 1990s. Uh, uh, so this is a sentence that I don't understand. <laughs> he said, conformal field theories associated to x plus and x minus, they should be related. Um, I don't understand these meanings, uh, these phrases. So let, let me just say that these two are very closely related. And uh, uh, so for me, uh, for, for me, it says uh, the, the curve counting on x plus should be very closely related to curve counting on x minus, and the drive category for x plus should be very closely related to x minus. That's uh, what I'm going to say today. Just let let me just, just skip this. <laughs> okay, so uh, on the x plus side, so this is the canonical line bundle of projective space P D minus one. And we have this function, W, we defined before, which is a product of P coordinate and the homogeneous polynomial F. Um, by, by very elementary calculus, local computation, you can see that critical locus is exactly the hypersurface, Calabi-Yau hypersurface in the projective space, defined by the homogeneous polynomial F of degree D. So, um, right, and then, um, and then the normal bundle of this hypersurface in PD minus 1 is exactly line bundle of degree D. And uh, we had the X plus is canonical line bundle. So it's a, it's a line bundle of degree minus D over the projective space, right? So the normal bundle to Q and uh, the canonical line bundle, they are dual, dual line bundles. And uh, if you look at a point in Q, X plus locally looks like Q times C2. And the function w is now just x times y, the pairing of the obvious pairing of dual vector spaces. Right. Um, so, and then the Calabi-Yau Landau Ginsburg correspondence says uh, if you think about the physical theory for x plus, that should be essentially the theory of the critical locus, Q. So, <laughs> now uh, that's that's uh, another localizing phenomenon I want to talk about, localizing to the critical locus of homomorphic function. So uh, if you combine this with uh, Witten's previous uh, statement, the x plus and x minus the theories should be related, then you can say that the theory on the Calabi-Yau hypersurface Q should be related to the theory on this uh, alpha space CD, quotient by the action of this finite group ZD and the function f, the LG model here. So, um, and according to Konsevich, if you, from a categorical point of view, the category for B brains uh, is the category of matrix vectorization if your LG model is CD and uh, with superpotential f. And then if you uh, think about the Calabi-Yau hypersurface Q, the B-brain category is the derived category of coherent shoes, Q, uh, DBQ. Okay, um, so, so let me first talk about category. So I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about the, these ideas for curve counting and these ideas for derived categories. The derived categories, discussion about derived categories mostly for motivation for curve counting theory. Anyway, so um, we so we 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 have we are we are trying to say that the uh, derived category of Q should be related to derived category of X plus and X minus. That's what uh, this is all about. And uh, in two thousand nine, Olof 
proved this, uh, this the correspondence. He proved that the right category of the Calabi-Yau hypersurface Q is actually equivalent to the triangulated category of matrix vectorizations, what is uh, homogeneous polynomial F. And a, a couple of years later, Ed Sewell said uh, maybe, perhaps the right, correct way of, from Felix's point of view, the correct way of thinking about the equivalence is to uh, go through X plus. So all of this proof uh, connects Q with X minus directly. Uh, basically, a matrix vectorization says uh, is nothing but uh, two projective modules over uh, the polynomial ring. And then uh, we have two homomorphies. <laughs> back and forth, and then you pick one of them and then take the co kernel and that's a, that's a module defined on the affine cone over Q because it's graded module, it gives me a coma, it gives you a co coherent sheet on the hypersurface uh, hyper Q. Um, so that's kind of classical uh, argument in some sense, um, in, in basically in Kuneris uh, old arguments, old proof. Um, so so it, it doesn't go through x plus, it connects q directly with x minus. And from physics point of view, as I mentioned in previous slides, it's perhaps natural to go through x plus. x plus connecting with q as critical locus, of, because the critical locus of f, f on x plus is q, and x minus and x plus should be related because they are two different GIT quotients of the same stack. And actually, Ed Siegel proved the first equivalence uh, by using a work of uh, Herbst, Hori, and Page. And the work of Hori, Herbst, Page is, is this. Uh, if you have an artist stack and if you have an open sub stack, which is a GIT quotient, then you can embed the derived category of the GIT quotient into the derived category of the artist stack. And that's given by something called grade selection rule. So uh, by using this uh, general result, he proved the equivalence of these two. But the interesting point is that the equivalence is not unique. There are, there are many, many equivalences of these two. And, uh, uh, it's quite interesting. But the second equivalence is, is open in general. That's uh, Calabial and the Whisper correspondence here. OK. so. Uh, let me go ahead. So, so what, what can we say about the second equivalence, the, the uh, Calabi-Yau lambda whisper correspondence in this case? Um, the global version of the second equivalence is, called, is, is the Gnera periodicity. Uh, uh, is, is, is a result in commutative algebra. And uh, all of, uh, all of uh, kind of uh, generalized the argument or developed uh, analog in Drive category theory in 2006, and he proved, <coughs> he proved this theorem. If you have a smooth quasi projective variety S and, uh, and uh, a, a regular function Y, and the zero locus is a smooth divisor, that's the assumption. And suppose you have another regular function which is not constant when restricted conditions for D and F, which would be the, is equivalent to the derived category. The category of matrix vectorizations on S times C with the superpotential F plus S1. Um, in particular, if you if you take this guy to be zero, then we have this equivalence derived category of the Calabi-Yau or, or smooth projective variety Q is equivalent to the uh, derived category of matrix vectorizations on Q times C2 with superpotential X times one. So um, so that's the, the global version of this, the edge Calabi-Yau landau Ginsburg correspondence, this part is, is known, but uh, that's, uh, th this kind of picture is, is works uh, holds only, only locally. We don't have global identification uh, like this. So, uh, so that, this part is still open, but uh, the simple case is proved by Olof. Um, I should mention, I uh, cannot pass without telling me this uh, interesting uh, application of all of construction. For the proof, all of use something called k list trick. Very elementary, but uh, quite useful. So, and uh, using this trick, uh, uh, we can answer a question of bundles. 
I think this, this question was originally motivated by homological mirror symmetry. Honda asked this question, uh, maybe less than 10 years ago. Uh, it asked this question, suppose you have a smooth projective variety Y. Can you find a final variety X whose derived category contains the derived category of Y? That's a wonderful question. It's called final visitor problem. If there is such a final X, Y is called a final visitor because it's visiting the world of final varieties by derived categories. So, and then X is called the final host. Um, uh, the conjecture is that every smooth projective variety is a final variety, a uh, final visitor. So what does that mean? So if this is true, if the answer is yes for any smooth projective variety, that means the study of derived categories of projective varieties is effectively reduced to the study of derived categories of only final varieties. If you understand the derived categories of final varieties only, then you basically understand all the derived categories of smooth projective varieties. That's the point of the final visitor problem. I'm sure there are some other motivations to raise this question by Bondo, but let me just mention this. So what is Cayley's trick? Uh, it's very elementary, algebraic geometry. Suppose you have a smooth projective variety S, and then you have a vector bundle F on S, and suppose you have a section S. And then uh, this section S gives me a, gives me a sub-variety, Y, the zero locus of the section, and suppose this, the, this is, this, the zero locus is smooth of expected co-dimension, namely the rank of the vector bundle. Now, we have this nice isomorphism. If, if, if you, project, you take the dual of the vector bundle F and projectivize it. And, and on this projectivized bundle, there is the natural O1, obvious O1, by projectivization. And uh, zeros comma, zeros, the cohomology is isomorphic to the space of sections of the vector bundle F. Let's just, uh, or just, uh, let's just push forward. Anyway, it's, 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 like, it's the first kind of, it's, it's, an, it's an exercise in the first year at the geometry course, probably. And so we have a section here, S. And so that gives me a section of this line bundle, O1, in the projectivized vector bundle, if you have dual. And uh, so, so this gives so S gives me an element here, and that gives me a hypersurface in the in PF dual, right? That's that's what I call X. And uh, what all proof is that uh, the derived category of Y defined by defined as a zero locus of section S is embedded into the derived category of X. The X is a hypersurface in the, the projectivized bundle dual of. Uh, Projectivized dual of F. And he proved that they, this is a fully faithful embedding of triangulated categories. So, uh, <laughs> so as, an, as, an, as, as a nice application with uh, Injun Kim, Huayang Lee, and uh, Kyung Seok Lee. Injun and Huayang were my postdocs, and Kyung Seok was my student. And uh, we proved that all complete intersection varieties are found with just using this K list trick and Bonda's theorem. Um, so this is a very, very nice theorem. Um, if if you are if you if you if, if your variety y is the, is a complete intersection, namely the intersection of uh, C hypersurface in projective space, the dimension of y is n minus C, expected dimension. Then so that's exactly this situation. The ambient space is projective space, and uh, you have a section of vector bundle which is direct sum of line bundles over the projective space. And then, uh, and then y is exactly your, your, your y you start with. And then you can apply this construction to get x. If x is final, then you, are, you, you win. So you <laughs> it's, it's a final beta. But unfortunately, it's not final in general. But, uh, but what we can do is that you can, we can, uh, you can add more uh, linear equations without changing x. And you can increase the rank of your vector bundle and uh, if, you, if you increase your rank sufficiently, then uh, at some point x becomes final. And then you get this, you have this nice semi or so world decomposition of your category. So that proves the theorem. So, so. The admissibility of the visitor is that part of the conjecture? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. 
So anyway, so it's a nice application of uh, all these developments. Okay, so uh, I guess that I guess that's uh, that's all I can say about the drive categories in this hour related to Calabria Landau Ginsburg correspondence. So let me talk. About, let me now move on to curve counting. So um, and. Uh, uh, as, as, you, as you all know, curve counting is the enumerative geometry uh, of finding the number of curves in a given smooth projective variety and uh, satisfying certain given conditions. And uh, in 19th century, Schubert uh, defined enumerative geometry. He gave a definition of enumerative geometry. He defined enumerative geometry as the study of finding the number of geometric figures of fixed type satisfying certain given conditions. So he did many computations, as we know, uh, but uh, it was considered as uh, not so rigorous. And Hilbert, uh, in 1900, proposed, when he proposed 23 problems, this is problem number 15, to provide a rigorous foundation of Schubert calculus. And we all know that rigorous foundation was provided by Fulton and McPherson in late 70s, and uh, if you're interested, in, you can take, take a look at this uh, very exciting book by Eisenberg and Harris. So, um, Fulton and McPherson gave a foundation, a rigorous foundation on its section theory, uh, but, uh, but there are certain limitations. It's, it still is not obvious how to intersect two arbitrary cycles in a single space. You can intersect uh, uh, a smooth Smooth, uh, smoothly embedded sub, uh, sub variety with arbitrary cycle, or you can embed you can intersect arbitrary cycles in a smooth variety. So you cannot think about two singular cycles in a singular space. That's uh, still not well defined as, as far as I know. So if your space if your space is horribly singular, um, you cannot expect to intersect arbitrary cycles. Uh, but you can intersect only nice cycles such as cohomology classes. Okay, so uh, so curve counting. Okay, so curve counting usually consists of uh, two steps. You first construct a uh, moduli space that classifies uh, classifies all geometric figures of fixed type or curves of fixed topological type, for instance. Um, then you think about the given conditions, and then each of the conditions give you cycles or subsets. And then you take the intersection theory, with the intersection numbers of the cycles. Um, and then, then, of course, the third step that I do mention is that uh, you, have to really ch you have to check that really the numbers you get is the, is the curve counting number. Anyway, um, these two steps give us two uh, issues. Right? The first issue is that uh, the moduli spaces should be compactified if you want to do intersection theory. But there are many, many ways of compact to compactify a space. Right? So if you're interested in curves, you can compactify the space of curves by uh, uh, Hilbert scheme, for instance, by thinking of the curves as ideal sheaves. Or you can compactify the uh, space of curves by uh, thinking about stable maps. Or, or stable pairs. Uh, there are many, many ways to uh, compactify modular spaces. So there comes the issue of classifying them or finding relations between the compactifications. So there comes the issue of the bi-rational geometry of modular spaces and the variation of QIT and many, many variants coming from different compactifications. The second issue is that the modular spaces are usually very singular, Murphy's law holds. And, uh, and so we cannot insect arbitrary cycles. So we should have uh, good, good cycles. Uh, moreover, when, when we are discussing curve counting, uh, we want our numbers to be invariant under deformation. We want to deform the target variety, ambient variety, or we want to deform the conditions and we want the number to be invariant. Because classically, I mean, um, when you want to compute the um, curve counting invariant, one of the key techniques is, is to deforming your constraints or ambient space to some, something simpler. 
and then we can finish the conflict, can finish the conflict efficiently. And uh, for that matter, we need this deformation invariance. Um, nowadays, there is a canonical way of obtaining a deformation invariant curve counting invariant. Um, since 1995, all curve counting invariants are defined as integrals of cohomology classes on virtual dynamic class of uh, suitable modular isolated curves. Um, so, two things. One thing is that we can only intersect cohomology classes, nice classes. And then, uh, you have, and then you have to use virtual dynamic class. Uh, I'll talk about this a little uh, later. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, there can be many ways to compactify the space of curves. If you use Hilbert scheme, then the uh, Hilbert scheme of curves on a Calabi-R threefold, the integrals you get are called the Thomas and Thomas invariant. And if you uh, X, if your X is modular space of stable maps, the integrals are homophytic invariants. Uh, a recent development in uh, curve counting theory these days, uh, this paper was completed only last month. Um, so in the, in the Donald Thomas theory, uh, the, one of the key issues was to generalize Donald Thomas theory to the case when there are some strictly semi-stable sheaves, because in that case, the modular space is not building Mumford anymore. It's just an Arkin stack, and uh, for Arkin stacks, uh, we don't have budget cycles. So that was an issue here, but uh, uh, Jun Lee and Michael Savas uh, together, uh, we, we could apply Cohen's partial desingularization process, plus uh, some construction we named intrinsic blow up to uh, resolve, resolve the stackiness of the modular space. Modular space and it, uh, by systematically applying partial desingularization together with section in intrinsic blow-ups, we could construct uh, uh, the Lim Mumford stack, which is birational to the modular stack of semi-stable sheaves, and then uh, the, the, the Lim Mumford stack comes with a natural virtual advantage class that enables us to define generalized Donald Thomas invariant for even when there are strictly semi-stable sheaves. Anyway, it's just a report of the recent development. Um, uh, as I can see, there's not everybody is an expert in, in virtual cycles in, in, this, in the audience. So let me just uh, try to convey the idea of virtual fundamental class here, yeah, very briefly, in one slide, or two, maybe two slides. <laughs> so, uh, in, so if, you're, if your X is of a uh, scheme of finite type, or to limit one type of finite type, you can always write your scheme as a zero locus of a section of vector bundle on a smooth variety M. That's always possible locally if, if X is finite type. Um, because you can choose a finite number of defining equations. Right, uh, but often the dimension of X is greater than the expected dimension, which is the dimension of M minus the rank of the vector bundle, the number of equations. Um, this dimension minus rank of F is often called the expected dimension or the virtual dimension. Now, in this case, in this local case, virtual fundamental class is nothing but Euler class of the vector bundle. Um, but, uh, but you, you know, oil, oil, taking Euler class on a non-compact manifold can be tricky, right? So you have to take uh, something called refined Euler class uh, vector bundle. So the idea is very s simple. So, um, so, so, uh, you per so you have section S of the vector bundle F. You perturb your section only in a neighborhood. So, um, so, so you can make sure that the intersection is transversal. And the, sorry, the, the graph of your section S prime, the third section, is transversal to the zero section. And so the, the intersection has dimension, the expected dimension. The real dimension is two times the virtual dimension. And uh, that's because you have trained S only in the neighborhood of X, constructible neighborhood of X. If the, homo the homology of U is the same as homology of X. So that's the topological idea of the virtual cycle. But if you want to, if you are an algebraic geometer, it's not good because you cannot perturb your section in algebraic geometry. Sections are very rigid in algebraic geometry. 
And what we do is instead we take the normal cone of uh, x in M, and then we apply the Gissing map, which is the, the isomorphism of the cohomology of the vector bundle F with the homology of x. So that's how algebraic geometry expresses this uh, perturbed intersection. Right. Um, then let, let, me move, let me explain directly. So cross-section localization will be the, our main tool or technique to uh, study canary periodicity in curve counting. So I should explain the cross-section localization directly here. Yeah. Local picture is also very easy to explain. It's, 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 it's very, very straightforward. So, um, so your x is now the zero locus of a section of vector bundle f on the manifold M. And suppose further you have a homomorphism from F to the trivial line bundle, O. So, so usually a section means a homomorphism from the trivial line bundle to F. So the, the arrow is reversed, so that's why you call it a cross-section of okay. F. Um, then the important thing is the zero locus of this cross-section, meaning that the locus where sigma is not surjective. Sigma is so we take a and then we take a contractile neighborhood of this zero locus of sigma. So in the complement of this neighborhood, the map sigma is surjective. So when this is surjective, then there cannot be. I mean, it's, the theory is trivial. That's what I'm going to say. And everything, everything interesting takes place in the neighborhood of the zero, the locus where sigma is not surjective. So, for instance, you can choose a Hermitian matrix on this complex vector bundle F. Then you can split the bundle F into direct sum of two copies of uh, direct sum of two vector uh, subbundles. So F bar is a subbundle of uh, one rank lower, and O is a trivial line bundle. It's just uh, so F bar is a kernel of this subjective uh, homomorphism. Right. So, so now. Um, now I can choose a section of this bundle F. So, so we want the Euler class of this vector bundle F, as I mentioned in the previous slide. So how do we choose a how do you choose a section of this vector bundle? We first choose a very small non-zero non section of this trivial bundle, and then we extend it to a continuous section of the bundle, the whole bundle F. Yeah. Then obviously um, the section S prime cannot be zero away from U. So the insertion can take place only in a neighborhood of the zero locus of sigma. And this U of sigma is uh, homotopic to sigma inverse zero. So our virtual cycle is the insertion the, the, of the section S prime with the zero section. So this is our virtual cycle. But that, that, uh, this has support in a uh, neighborhood of uh, Sigma inverse of zero, so the virtual cycle is supported in the zero locus of the cross section. Um, that's a topological description, but if you want to explain, if you want to, <laughs> once again, we cannot perturb a section in algebraic geometry. If you're an algebraic geometer, there is another way, there is a different way of expressing the uh, transversal intersection. You pick a resolution of the subjective homomorphism and then choose the lift of your cycle and so on. Okay. Uh, let me not, not talk about the details. Yeah. Anyway, there's, a, there's an algebraic way of expressing what is written there. Now, we want to make it global. So, so, so far, the, the description of the virtual cycle and section localization is local description. So how do you globalize this? As I mentioned, locally, we can always write your x as the zero locus of a section, s alpha, of a of a vector bundle F alpha on M alpha, M alpha is smooth. That's always possible. Then, um, okay, then on each open set X alpha, we have a tangent bundle and F alpha, and you can think about the differential of the section S alpha. So the kernel of this morphism is a tangent, tangent sheaf of X alpha. The co kernel is called the obstruction sheaf. On this open set X alpha. And uh, we have to assume that these obstruction sheaves uh, can be glued. Um, okay, that's a, that's, a, that's a consequence of some uh, the existence of structure called perfect obstruction theory. 
So the, the, the key point of perfect obstruction theory is the gluing of the obstruction sheet together with the gluing of obstruction assignments. Anyway, so these core kernels, the, the, the obstruction sheets glue. So um, this is an algebraic way of defining virtual cycle. So we consider the normal cone of X. And then you take the intersection of the normal cone with the uh, zero section of the obstruction sheet. That's the virtual cycle in algebraic geometry. Um, and, then, and then also we can globalize the cross-section localization. If you have a morphism from the obstruction sheet to the structure sheet in the trivial line bundle, then the virtual cycle is localized to the zero locus of the cross-section. Yes. And uh, the, the, the construction is the same. You, to, you, apply the, you think about the normal count, but you can localize your decent map. Exactly like perturbing the intersection of uh, your section with the zero section. Okay, so um, any questions so far? So uh, in some good cases, um, if you're lucky, <laughs> the zero locus of cross section is very, very easy. Sometimes uh, the zero locus of the cross section becomes just one point, one point. This is the case of, for the Hilbert scheme of curves, and uh, curves in the, uh, on a projective surface with a uh, holomorphic two form. So, so we can, we can, it's very easy to compute the, uh, the virtual cycle in this case. And using this, well, uh, yeah, and uh, I could uh, prove uh, the conjecture of uh, Dur, Kavanov, and Okolek, which says that the uh, cyber width invariant of a smooth projective surface is the virtual intersection number on the Hilbert scheme of divisors. And they call it the Poincaré invariant. And, uh, and, and previously, Mochizuki proved the uh, equivalence of cyber with, sorry, sorry, equivalence of Donaldson invariant with the cyber, uh, with Poincaré invariant. Mochizuki proved the equivalence of Donaldson with uh, Poincaré, and uh, so, and uh, we proved the conjecture that tells us that Poincaré is equivalent to cyber with, so, so cyber with is equivalent to Poincaré, Donaldson, um, as expected uh, uh, since. Since cyber weight invariant was introduced like 20 years ago, but but now we have a solid proof as an application of the cross-section localization. Right. So, um, but still, um, uh, cross-section localization can be. Uh, uh, there is a variation of the cross-section localization. So uh, there is something called torus localization or virtual fundamental classes. And we can combine the torus localization and cross-section localization. Uh, that was proved uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and then also, we can think about k-theoretic cross-section localization. Uh, there is a k-theoretic version of a virtual fundamental class that's called virtual structure shift. Um, and uh, if the, the obstruction shift has a cross-section as before, the virtual structure sheet is also localized to zero locus of the cross section. The, so this cross section localization is not just a phenomenon for but, uh, child groups. This is a phenomenon for um, a deeper level, I suppose. The same holds for motivic cohomology. So. Okay. Uh, and uh, last summer, Professor Yao asked me a question. How torus localization and cross section localization are related. Uh, and uh, in the special case, it's quite obvious. If the obstruction theory is symmetric, symmetric means that uh, X is locally the zero locus of not just uh, any vector bundle, but it's the section of cotangent bundle. Okay, then we say it's a, it's a, it's a symmetric, sorry, it's, it's a symmetric obstruction theory. Um, for instance, f x can be the locally the critical locus of a homomorphic function. Um, and then, if you have a torus section, that, that means you have a vector field, right? A homomorphism from the structure shift to the tangent bundle. And then you can take the dual of this guy, which is the dual bundle of uh, the cotangent bundle of m goes to O x. So this is a cross section. Now this is the obstruction bundle. 
and then this is a cross section of the suction bundle. So in this case, cross section localization is exactly the same as torus localization. No, no difference at all in this in this special case. Um, but I, I don't know I don't know uh, if there is a common generation of that of, of uh, torus localization and cross section localization at the same time. Um, it, in my mind, cross section localization is much much more elementary, fundamental. And torus localization is much more sophisticated. It requires uh, cross section localization is essentially topological construction, and torus localization is essentially syntactic <coughs> phenomena. Right, so um, now uh, let me try to explain the uh, main idea related to uh, virtual linear periodicity, the uh, localizing virtual fundamental class to the critical locus. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, all of derived linear periodicity compares the derived category of uh, some space to the with the derived category of the critical locus. So in this case, in the case of Q times C2 with the superpotential xy, the critical locus is just Q, and the derived category of Q is the same as the C brain category of Q times C2 with superpotential W. So what can you say about uh, analog in curve counting theory? Um, so so we can expect the curve counting on the smooth project, smooth hypersurface Q, smooth Calabria hypersurface Q in projective space should be related to curve counting on the canonical line bundle of PD minus one. Um, but okay, so how how can you achieve that? So first of all, you think about the modular space of curves on in Q. You can think of modular of stable mass voices to Q. And then you can think about modular stable maps to the ambient projective space PD minus one, and uh, and let's think let's say there is a normal bundle. So uh, in general, I have to think about the normal bundle as a drive category object. But let's uh, let's let's pretend that there is normal bundle of MQ in uh, and PD minus one. Um, uh, right. Then. Uh, and the virtual cycle for M of Q should be related to the virtual cycle on the normal bundle. A uh, dual of the normal bundle, sorry. Dual of the normal bundle. Dual, that's, uh, dual of the normal bundle should, uh, but curve counting should be related to curve counting for M Q. But uh, we have to be careful, we have to take the derived, uh, derived dual of the normal bundle because in general, the normal bundle is only a derived category. Okay, so how can we do this? So let me let me talk about a situation where it works uh, perfectly. So suppose X is a dream of perspective with perfect obstruction theory. So in my mind, P is the modular of uh, stable maps to projective space, and this space P D minus one in the previous picture. And uh, so perfect obstruction theory means that we have a complex two-term complex of locally free sheaves vector bundles E0 and E1. And then if if you restrict to if this two-term complex to an open chart X alpha, which is a zero locus of a section of a vector of a vector bundle over over smooth M alpha, then and this guy E should be isomorphic to the standard complex, two-term complex, tendent bundle F alpha. The map between them is theta. Then we say it's a perfect obstruction theory. Right. Um, now suppose suppose that we ha also have a two-term complex of vector bundles on X, and then uh, suppose you have we have a section of N zero, the first vector bundle, and this W lies in the kernel of the the map delta n. Okay, and then we consider the zero cost of w in x. That's, that's my y. Okay, so, um, right. 
uh, and, a, and a, a, little, a little more assumption. Suppose you have a surjective chain maps. We have to be able to compare these e to uh, compare these two complexes e and n. Okay, so it, take the differential e w and suppose you could compare e and n. E zero goes to n zero. E one goes to n one by the differential w. Okay, and then so so we have a map from e to n, and then we can think about the kernel of this map. That's e prime, and e prime gives me a perfect obstruction theory. One. That's 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 an assumption. So far, it's an assumption. So, meaning it just means that um, the perfect obstruction theory of x and y are very nicely related. So sometimes we call it virtually smooth. Um, so, so y is embedded into x, and then for canary periodicity, we have to add the, the dual of the normal bundle, right? If you remember canary periodicity that I described before. We have to add the dual bundle, dual of the, the normal bundle n. So first, we take, so we take the dual, right? Dual of n one, dual of n zero, dual of the map between them, and uh, right, and then we take the kernel of this map delta n dual, and that's my z. So, okay. so we want to add n, n dual, but uh, it's n, adding n dual. It's, it's, not, it's not a scheme or it's not a delete morph step. If, but you want to get a delete morph step, right? Or scheme. It's a, so you take a kernel, and that, and, uh, as a scheme, you, if you want to think of this as a scheme, you take the symmetric product of the co kernel delta n and then take this back. That's uh, how you think of this as a, as, a, as a scheme or delete morph step. Um, so so that's, our, that's, that's our enlargement of x. To include the dual, the potent dual of the normal bundle, and uh, and uh, by construction, there is an obvious relative obstruction theory of z over x. We are simply adding uh, kernel delta n. So uh, the the relative obstruction theory is exactly uh, this guy. And, um, right. So so now my space z is x plus the kernel of delta n. So the, it comes with a natural perfect obstruction theory, which is a direct sum of E together with n dual. Now, under this setting, we have a canonical cross-section, canonical construction cross-section. So E1 goes to N1. That was by DW in the previous slide. We assumed that there is a map from E1 to N1. And then uh, there is an identity map from N0 to T self. And then this guy can go to the structure sheaf. Okay, uh, n1 can be paired with p. p is an element in n1 dual. So I can pair it, and it gives me a section of O. And then n0 dual is, uh, is a, is, can, be, can be paired with w. w is a section of n0 in the previous slide. So, so everything goes to the structure sheaf, I mean, or the canonical line, a trivial line bundle. So this, this is a cross section. And the zero locus of this cross section is exactly y. So starting with x, we consider a, a, a soft scheme y, and then a, some bigger scheme z, and then y and z uh, they should be very closely related. And indeed, it is true. <laughs> okay, but if you can, because of the cross section, we can apply the cross section localization and consider the uh, virtual cycle of this big space, then uh, the, the virtual cycle okay, is supported in the zero locus of the cross section. That's exactly why. So the virtual cycle is a class, mod class of y. Now the difference of uh, e tilde is the direction of uh, e tilde is the virtual perfect obstruction theory for z. And the difference of the perfect obstruction theory for z and y is the symmetric obstruction theory like this. And uh, the virtual cycle for symmetric obstruction theory is just sine, plus one or minus one. Minus one rank one. Minus one to the power of rank, rank n. So the virtual cycle for y is related to virtual cycle of z by this formula. So this, this, is, uh, this is our virtual linear periodicity. Um, so I'm, I'm, unfortunately, the discussions are a bit technical. It's necessary. Anyway, so I think this is a, this is a natural analog of uh, 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 
Quaternary period is the curve counting or virtual cycle theory. Any questions? Is there any questions so far? Okay, so uh, let me discuss some examples. Uh, so first example is by William in June uh, uh, 2012. Here, so Q is the Calabria or hypersurface. Uh, and then uh, X is the moduli of stable maps to the projective space. And then C is the universal curve and then universal uh, map to PD minus 1. And N in this case is the locally free resolution of this sheaf. We have a, a degree D line bundle on the projective space. Pull it back and push it down. And then you can find the two term complex of locally free sheaves. Um, that's my N. Okay, then uh, uh, we, we had F here, and this F gives me a section of N0, because it's, 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 it's an, So if you have a section of uh, OD on PD minus 1, you can put it back to C and push it down to X. So it gives me a section of N0, lying in front of delta N. So we are now exactly the setup I explained before. So we can think about the enlargement of x, that's z, and, and uh, what we have to do is we have to add uh, something called p-field, so to a map from c to pd minus 1, you have to add a field p, which is a se section of the pullback of the canonical line bundle of pd minus 1 tensored with the dual line shift of the curve c. So you can think of, as a, think of the pair x and p as a twisted map to the canonical line of uh, the projective space. So the cross-section description of the cross-section is exactly the same, and then zero locus of the cross-section is exactly the modular stable map to the Calabria hypersurface Q. So, so what? After all, cross-section localization tells us that the Gromov-Fitton invariant of Q is the same as the Gromov-Fitton invariant of the KPD minus one. Now you can ask, uh, so this, uh, this was our x plus, right? The, the theory on x plus should be related to the theory on x minus. So what can you say about the uh, Witten's statement or proposal that the theory for x plus should be related to theory for x minus? Um, for x minus, uh, there is a similar story. So algebraic construction of uh, Punjabi's run Witten invariant for narrow sectors. Uh, let me just skip this. We have a very similar construction. Um, oh, uh, right. I uh, cannot entirely skip this. Okay. So, uh, so the point, the point of FJRW theory is a curve counting on uh, x minus this D, CD mod CD. So, what is what is a curve? What, you, what is a curve on x minus? You have to think about a map uh, from a curve to CD, mod CD. So uh, the map should be should consist of uh, this data. Uh, there is a trivial line bundle on trivial line bundle on CD. You can pull it back to C. So you should be able to choose a line bundle on C. On C. And then uh, your C has an orbifold structure, it's an orbifold curve, and then. Uh, this ZD quotient uh, tells me that uh, this power of L should be isomorphic to the low canonical dual line shift, low canonical shift on C. And then um, uh, map to CD means that you have to choose these sections of the line bundle. Um, right, and then, uh, and then we can think about obstruction space, and then DW and P gives me a cross section. Zero locus of the cross section is exactly the the x is not not compact, but the zero locus is compact here. It's exactly the uh, an attack cover of the modular stable maps M G and bar. Okay, and then you comply the cross-section localization, and then virtual cycle is a multi-class in M G and bar. The uh, default plus. Uh, um, default cover. Um, integrating cohomology classes 
over this culture cycle gives me gives us the FGL double invariant uh, for the narrow sector. What do you mean by narrow sector? Narrow sector means that the old fold, old fold structure at the mark points, the stabilizer groups act uh, non-trivially on the fiber of the line on the L. That's uh, what I mean by narrow sector. So now in, the, in, the, in this setup, the NG lambda winsberg calabria correspondence conjecture means the equivalence of these three things, both the invariant of the Calabria hypersets Q, um, the Chang Li theory, <coughs> and then Chang Li Li theory <coughs> of FGL double invariants for narrow sectors. Uh, so these three things are expected to be equivalent in the uh, Chang Li Li Liu. Waiting the Elisa Liu. Uh, they have a theory of a big modular space with a torus section. And one side we have modular stable maps, and the other side, uh, a modular space for this guy. And on the other side, you have modular space for this guy, and then there is a torus section. And these two spaces are fixed points of the torus section. There are some other fixed points. The difference of these two invariants should be uh, computable by the intermediate fixed points. That's what, they, they, that's what this project is all about. Yeah. They, I'm, I'm, I've, I've done, I think they've done their computation for genus 1 and genus 2. So, uh, plus there is possible another approach about LGCY correspondence. You can think about wall crossing. We can even make, think of a bigger, bigger stack. <laughs> we can enlarge the stack. You can think of the stack of quadruples. Curve, line bundle, uh, sections, and then uh, this P field. And then the point is that uh, there are many, many stability conditions in this big enough modular stack. Uh, and, and in fact, there are two. We, we define there, there. There are two lines of stability conditions, two sequences of stability conditions: absolute stability and delta stability. And the hope is to compare the. Uh, GW and FJRW by wall crossings of delta stability and FJR stability. Oh, okay, so this, this is the, uh, the hope. So, epsilon infinity is chromo written, epsilon minus infinity is FJRW. You do the wall, you compute the wall crossing, and you will get epsilon zero minus. You will get epsilon zero plus. You have to compare these two. The computation is not trivial, and the point is that there is another line of stability conditions. Delta line, delta infinity, delta minus infinity, infinity, and delta wall crossing. And uh, del at delta zero, the wall crossing is almost trivial. Anyway, so that's another approach for Calabria uh, Lambda visible correspondence. Um, what I'm working on these days uh, so is, uh, is FJRW for both sectors. Um, so, finally, uh, through and constructed the uh, homological field theory for uh, LG models um, by using analysis. And Goldschild Maintrop used matrix factorization and free frame required transform to construct the homological field theory. Uh, the, the Hilbert space for FJR theory is the space of left shift symbols. The Hilbert space for Polish Maintrop is the Hochschild homology of the category of matrix factorizations. They are isomorphic, canonically. Um, so what I'm what, what we are trying to do is to give a construction of the homological field theory by cross-section localization. Uh, the, so if you have read the paper, it's over 100 pages. This is even longer, 120 pages or more. And uh, there is the, the proof is not complete. You have to read another book for the essential part, the analytic part. The core analytic part of the proof is in another paper or book. Um, recently, what we observed is this uh, a very, very pleasant observation is that, um, so here's the diagram. So X is the as a, uh, X is like in FJRW theory. You have uh, spin curves, and then you have a choice of uh, sections. And, uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> and there's a natural map to S, because it, it 
lies over the modular field curves. And then there is a map to uh, affine space. It's just the evaluation of evaluation at the broad mark points. Um, and uh, by the rest of this theorem, this map Q factors through the zero locus of the Seb Sebastiani tomb sum of uh, the superpotentials. Um, right, so, <laughs> so uh, what, what's, what's nice is that there is a cross section in this setting for the obstruction relative obstruction shift of x over b0. And then uh, for the normal cone of x also uh, is localized to the corner of the cross section. And so it's, it's a perfect setting for applying cross section localization. Yeah. So we are writing down the proof, but I'm very, I'm, 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 I think it's, it's fine. So the cross section localized virtual pullback gives us a cohomological field theory. Our proof is, uh, I, I believe it's, our construction is very straightforward and geometric and very co concise. Um, so I guess my time's up. Uh, thank you for attention. Thank you. Questions?